Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tech Educator Podcast, coming to you live each and every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern with your hosts, Jeff Herb, John Samuelson, Sam Patterson, and Jeff Bradbury. Hello, everybody. It is Sunday night, November 3rd, 2013. Welcome to the 34th episode of the Tech Educator Podcast. We are so happy you are joining us today. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and today we are talking all about coding and how you can teach your kids how to code. In fact, it's actually the first of a two-part series where this week and next we're going to be talking all about teaching your kids how to code and work with coding. There's, of course, several ways that you can contact the show each and every week and participate in the Tech Educator Podcast. We love it, of course, when you check out our website, techeducatorpodcast.com, and you can, of course, subscribe to us right here on our YouTube channel by clicking on here. You can, of course, catch us live each and every Sunday night at 7 o'clock, and we love it, of course, when you check us out and visit us over at teachercast.tv each and every night. Want to say one more time, thank you, everybody out there. You can call us. You can participate. There's a lot of great stuff going on. We have a jam-packed show, and tonight I want to introduce our co-host, Mr. Sam, with a green halo over top of him, Patterson. Sam, how are you today? I am great, Jeff. I've had an amazing weekend, just chock full of ed tech wonderfulness, so... I'm having a great time. And it appears that you have recently been um, swimming in kryptonite because you have a really nice green haze to you. Uh, is this a new feature to this to this Sunday night show? It, it is. It is. my my. It's actually a gamma radiation exposure, and we're just hoping I get through the, the uh, night without turning into the Incredible Hulk. Now, is this a radiation thing, or is this something that's like, you know, space... Done or like what, what, what? I, I'm pretty sure the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator had an issue. Now I, I'm concerned because with radiation this much, this has to have an effect on Waka. Is he orange and green, or is this just like a? a, a you sandwich? know, I I, ha I haven't even checked in on him yet. Is he is, is he, he available? around here somewhere? I think we Let's would like we to start the show by by wow. Waka, you look like you're in the 70s. Uh, how 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 are things out there? <laughs> They're they're uh, slow and unpleasant. I, I don't know what's going on here. Well, that does explain a lot. Slow and unpleasant. I'd like to bring on to the show Mr. John Samuelson. John, how are you today? <laughs> I'm fine. How are you? Doing well. It's good to see you. Uh, uh, what's been going on in the world of John and, and Texas and Techlandia? Um, Is it tex um, Techlandia or Texlandia? Yeah, we should change the name maybe to Texlandia. That's not a bad idea. Um, you know what? We had a nice show with Dave Guyman uh, and Michelle Cordy, two of my favorite uh, people in the Twitter land, and they were on Techlandia. We actually taped on Friday, and we just found out that in two weeks we will have the lovely and talented Kristen Swanson on. Is she and that is a big friend of Sam's, I know. Is, so, Is Kristen going to bring the puppet with her? Kristen might. I, maybe we need to bring Sam and Waka on with Kristen because I heard that Waka tries to get in on and now is now going moving from George Kuros over to Kristen and uh, introducing her at keynotes and things like that. Well, so. that, that, that oh, I, I like I like to hang out with Kristen wherever I can. That, she she cuddles almost as well as uh, Ramsey. <laughs> Gordon Ramsey. Ramsey no. Masalam. Oh, yes, right. Um. Walker, you're, you're, you 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 kind of have this end of Back to the Future fading out kind of thing right now, man. There's a lot of weird stuff going on on this end, Jeff. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Jeff, how are the you today? <laughs> I'm doing well, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I believe the audience is asking the question, how's married life? Married life is good. Actually working on... Uh, getting a house right now so that's been taking up a lot of time excellent but overall yeah things are good excellent and uh where are, you, where are you looking jeff uh in lombard Ooh, lombard okay you're yeah, gonna I, like I know that one. you're gonna have to let us know well ahead of time so we can practice saying jeff from like kansas yeah. or, or you know lombard. You, are... you can lombard. continue saying chicago so that people know where the heck i actually am well but, that's, that's good what's been going on with the uh, inst tech talk Inst Tech Talk. Uh, we are finishing up. We should be releasing our Apple Configurator uh, demo and whole configuration guide by the end of the week, which will be good. Um, had a lot of people asking for that, so I'm excited to be able to share that out. Uh, additionally, we've been doing an interview with uh, 
company called CU Meeting, and they have this new uh, conference software that they're putting together that they're interested to start sharing with educators. So we're doing a meeting with them, too. Nice, <laughs> nice. Waka, what is happening over there? Waka, uh, I'm you... sorry. I'm sorry. I was, I was falling asleep. Meetings. <laughs> I just... I, I, you, I was interested that you were talking about meetings and conference software and configure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Waka. Well, before we get into the show, I want to remind everybody that we do have a, an active community here. Of course, you can check us out on the TeacherCast educational broadcasting community. There's a link right on our page on Tech Educator Podcast. And we also love it when you participate in our weekly chat right on our page at TeacherCast.tv. Want to shout out to some of the people here who are here tonight. Give a big round of applause. Everybody, John, big round of applause for Craig Oh, Yen. I'm sorry. Woo! And also uh, a nice big round of applause to the queen of Arizona, Miss Peggy George. So thank you guys all. And, of course, if you have any questions, please use the hashtag Tech Educator and find us on Twitter at Tech Ed Show. Now, tonight we are talking about a topic that... I'll tell you, is a little bit foreign to where I am right now. Uh, we're talking a little bit about coding. Sam, tell us a little bit about coding and, and what are some of the things that we want to look for if we want to even start to learn how to do this stuff. Well, computer programming and coding has been around for quite some time. It's become more accessible over the years. And what is going on right now in a lot of schools with the push for STEM education is and with the availability of BYOD, there's a lot of people working on how to get a much wider band of kids learning about coding and coding fundamentals in school. And when I talk to people about coding, sometimes I'll ask them, so when do you think programming should start? And Jeff, what, what, what do you think? When should programming start? Uh, 25 like, weeks right now. 20. I, is, well, that's, that's a very subjective <laughs> time. I, I, I think if I were to guess, that might be exactly how old the edu triplets are. Is that right? Uh, yes, we're trying to put them to work as soon as possible. We have diapers to, to, to buy. I, I think if you could get them all coding on something early, that might be good. Um, before they but, were bo before they're born, that would be a trick to get them coding. That's a new. I, I, that's got to be an app somewhere. Well, Somebody's making that app right now. Well, they're that's a significant user interface problem, actually. In, in utero <laughs> coding. But, yeah, what's the I, think it's gonna, I think it's going to take some sort of an ultrasonic keyboard, <laughs> and um, well, I, I just. I don't think Jen's going to be on board for this at all. <laughs> but, but they're kicking up a storm right now. I figure we got to get some kind of Bluetooth system in here. I don't know. Can we can we do something with magnets, John? What do you know well, about this? I mean, I think then if you do start to do that, they might start glowing like Sam. So you better be careful <laughs> if you start the Bluetooth at uh, 25 weeks. Anyway, Sam, so coding in this in schools, we can <laughs> actually start teaching kids fundamentals of coding as young as kindergarten mm -hmm. um, with iPad apps. There is an iPad app that I'm using right now called Codable Pro. That's with a K, K O D A B L E. Um, and that app, it looks just like Pac-Man, basically, when you start. Not just like, but you have a guy and a route. And they actually the, put in the arrows, what direction the character is going to turn at which time. And they have to put in those directions ahead of time, then they click play, and it plays through the directions. And if they got it wrong, the sad trombone song plays. And I was teaching some kindergartners to use this app this week, and the first time when we were demoing, I showed getting it wrong, and they heard the sad trombone sound, and they were all just like, whoa, what's that? I'm like, oh, that's sad trombone. Do you know what that means? And they're like, no. So then we got to talk about like sad trombone and how it actually meant you're doing great, try it again. And they're like, that's cool. There you sad go. Sad trombone. Sad trombone, right? It's, it's a it's a universally named sound, and now I have like helped build the kindergartner's schema, so it's something positive and reinforcing, right? And then with second grade this week, we were actually going to use hopscotch, which codes in two dimensions, kind of X and Y. But um, I work at a religious school that it does not observe Halloween, and. <laughs> They, they, no, there's, there is no, this month there was no October holiday. Um, Can we talk about that real quick? Sure, sure. 
how does how do you not observe it? Like, explain well, you, what you, happens at your school that makes you not observe Halloween. Somebody says, there, look, there there's Halloween, no... and someone says, where? Yeah, there, there is, exactly. I see no Halloween. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, we just cut the day out of the calendar and throw it away. No, uh, there is no um, I think, I think no the Raiders formal... did that today. Ooh. There's no formal celebration of Halloween on campus. There's no parties or dress up or anything like that. And you know, when the kids ask why, we say, "Well, it's not a Jewish holiday, so we don't celebrate it here." Um, and on November first, I open up the iPads. I'm getting ready to launch into Hopscotch, and I'm just doing my before class run through. And there's this banner that comes across that says, "All of your favorite Hopscotch characters are in costume." Right. So like, the bear is a zombie with his brain exposed. <laughs> and it is. That's true. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I, I can't put zombie bear in front of the second graders today on the day after Halloween because the teachers will kill me because we do all of it, all that we can to pretend it doesn't exist. So instead we went with Daisy the Dinosaur, and that ended up being a perfect match for the second graders. There's a lot of active literacy involved because they have to actually read the directions on the screen and then do what it says, where Codable basically shows them what they need to be doing and then gives them an opportunity to do it. So there's kind of different levels of modeling in those two apps. But those are both for the iPad, which allows for some really great iPad-based instruction that teaches if-then statements, teaches recursive commands, teaches uh, loading sets of commands, uh, teaches kind of interactivity of two different programs. So, yeah, there's a lot that can go on there. And where before we used to say, well, you can't really do much with this until fifth grade where they can manage you know, the quasi-complex syntax of coding. Now, with object-oriented programming, we see that programming practice creeping younger and younger and younger. Hmm. And that's all we have for you. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs> right, and... <laughs> right. Go code. No, this, this, uh, I've been getting a lot of emails about this and seeing some stuff about this. Are any of the rest of you signed up for code.org's Hour of Coding? The um, Hour of Code? I've been promoting it a lot. You know that I'm not in a school now, so I can't be signed right. up for it. But, yes, I have, I've been trying to put it out there for people because I think it's interesting. Tell us so more about have, this. Yeah, can you walk us through what the Hour of Code is, John? Okay. Is? All right, so I'll, I, from what I've been seeing, and it is at it is at code.org, so I'll take a look over there while I'm looking at it. But um, And csedweek.org also. Oh, okay, so that, I haven't seen that one, too. Okay, so, of course, my favorite right off the bat, as I can see as we go over to the CSEDwork.org, and we have Chris Bosch from the Miami Heat, one of my favorites, the Miami Heat. Does his head hurt? <laughs> yeah. What, is, is he he's suffering from cognitive dissonance? I, I don't know. Miami well, he, Heat there? He's thinking really hard, you know, about uh, LeBron James and Dwayne Wade, I think. But um, so what it is is basically they have a bunch of different PSAs from these different um, celebrities almost, and they're a minute long. And they go through and they talk about how important coding is and how that we're going to go ahead. And I think, well, do you know what the day is for it? That's the hard part it's, I can't think it's of. A, it's a week-long event, December week -long 9 event. through 15. Okay, and so they have, like, all these different... So they have, like, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, and, of course, any no coding would be complete without Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas. But they have all these... I think he wrote most of the... Uh, didn't he write Angry Birds? <laughs> he, might, he might have. And then, of course, my favorite Twitter follow follower, Ashton Kutcher. But um, So it has a bunch of these celebrities, but so it, what it's trying to do is it's trying to get all these different kind of scattershot celebrities to talk about how important they think coding is. And so they've done these little PSAs, and they're going to take that during that week. They want you just to take one hour and start to go and talk about just the different coding things. And I think that some of the things that Sam just talked about, like, um, and I can demo them in a second. I'm trying to, I'm actually trying to download Daisy the Dinosaur right now since Sam's reflector is not working. But um, I have Hopscotch and Lightbot on mine. But I think that there are some different. Um, things that you can do where you just go through and talk about coding. I, one of the things that we had at my school last year was we had, um, we always have a great science day and during science day we actually made a huge mistake and you know how you get like the um, animal person that comes in with all the animals to pet and whatever, it's like a huge draw, the animal person comes in like the, the uh, 
like the Seinfeld episode where they have a Kramer has him in. So we actually did miss mixed communications, and all of a sudden the animal person wasn't there. So they go, Samuelson, you're up. Entertain these kids that are expected to see all these animals. Literally like five. We minutes need a monkey, before. John. Right, hit right. The stage. John, entertain them. And you know what we did was actually we brought them in and. Um, I would. I had just come back from Portland, and my good friend Allison Anderson had showed me a uh, showed me a site on Google where the kids could go in, and we just started. And so I br I put it up on the screen, and we just actually took that hour instead of going through and looking at the animals, we went through and did coding and just did basic coding skills where you were trying to maneuver just the the object around the maze, and it was amazing how quickly kids picked it up. And because of course I have to entertain kids kindergarten through fifth grade at the last minute, so. You've got to hit all these different skill levels, and it was amazing how, with just a, like a five to six minute demo, how quickly some of the kids picked up how to go through and code, and they got pretty advanced. And instead of just going straight to the goal or whatever, moving the turtle, they actually went through and were like, "Here, watch! I can do all the loop and hit every single square, and then get them over there." And so it's interesting, but kids really enjoy doing it, and I think if no. they get that basic stuff going first. To be fair, John, entertaining a large number of young children is kind of like you just being at home, right? Yeah, that's why they, they know that I don't really care about that. That's just that's just what I do. Right, what, right. What so now there's some is. there's some great activity coming in on the Twitter feed. Some love for uh, Codable. We've got AJ four six. You saying Codable rocks? They have it on all their iPads, grade K through six. Um, and Deborah Boatwright is talking a lot about how versatile scratches and what we've been doing at my school is kind of trying to plan out you know we've made a commitment to being a STEM school we've gone uh, you know iPad augmented instruction and now we're looking at really what does coding look like K through 8 what fits where what, what choices are we gonna make but one of the things like we started talking about the logistics of our of code right we have two computer labs and even though the 6th through 8th graders have iPads, we have one iPad cart. So if we were going to all code in the same hour, then we would need a lot of kind of paper-based coding proxy assignments, which don't really sound that exciting to me, or somehow like group that connected to the teacher's computer. So one of the questions I have for you guys is, all right, if let's say your school site makes a commitment every teacher is going to teach one hour of coding to students logistically how long does that take Ooh, right that could take that could take the whole week at that, point. that could take the whole week if, if I only have one lab that uh, the or two labs that advanced code editors are available in even if I'm just using the I don't know if uh, Code Academy works on iPads I, did, I haven't checked that recently, but I know that it struggles some just on my desktop with Internet Explorer, so I'm not that confident that it would run necessarily within the iPad world. Um, but, you know, logistically, how do you do that? We've talked about making that Sunday of Hour of Code Week a uh, family coding day or something like that at our school. We don't know. So, John, it looks like you've got Daisy the dinosaur up there. Can you see it? Is is my Google working? Yeah, I can. Okay. I can definitely see it. Okay, good. All right, because it was it was doing the same thing you were talking about before. The new Hangout, you have to re reinstall everything. Okay, so I have Daisy the dinosaur. If you can see it, and so this is the one. Now, um, when I learned about this one, I have to say I learned from the one of the greatest kindergarten teachers in my recent memory, Matt B. Gomez on Twitter. And so um, I remember Matt showed this off one time, and he uses it with his kindergartners. But so I'm just going to do some free play here. But so you can see that you, what you're going to do basically is, oh, I don't want to do that, is you're going to go ahead and you're just going to click and drag. So I'm clicking the move on. You can and you see how the, the program told you what to do there? You clicked on the wrong spot, and it automatically popped up a prompt to be like, no, take the move block and put yeah. it in the program <laughs> section. Do this, buddy. And so you can sit there, and you go through, and you can... Make you sure it. that you're going through it, and then you can just now, go. You got to put something in that repeat five, John. You can't what do you want me to do? Repeat. Um... Like, like put the put the grow in that repeat five. Okay. There you go. Okay. Here we now go. Now play that. Whoa. 
That's awesome. And so then you can sit there and you can just keep going and... So you're in the free play mode, but there's also a challenge mode where they basically roll out the commands one at a time. There are six different challenge modes that basically serve as a tutorial. What I like about this is there's that first step, which is really they have to read that to figure out what they want to do next. And that was a really good uh, activity to do with the kids. Look at that. I'm amazing. <laughs> um, okay. it, it might throw that word amazing around pretty easily. Just it saying. might. So pretty forward, crazy. jump, get it. Oh, look at that. And so you can see how this would be great for little kids then. So then this one says make Daisy spin five times. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and you have they have to the, the kids that I worked with, the second graders, struggled with at this point because they didn't understand they had to put five spins in there. And then once they did that, the next step, involves setting up a repeat five with the spin command. So they're teaching you how to build repetitive sets of commands. Watch out, Daisy. Oh, look at that. I even did a fancy one there. See, did you see I jumped first? I, I, you added spin? that jump, right? You, you I know. got that style. So that's what kids start to do with it then. They, they start to go ahead and do the little the challenges, flare. but then they also, yep, they like to give it their own flair. So anyway, that's Daisy the Dinosaur. And how much does this one cost, Sam? Daisy's free. Oh, it's free. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a good one. you got to like free. Codable a... is free also. There's a free version, and there's a Codable Pro, which is a paid version. And Codable Pro basically comes with everything unlocked, and I think there's even a teacher's guide ex accessible with it. So that's a really good one to do for education because the regular one is just their consumer model, and they're trying to get people to buy access to the higher levels there. Um, Codable Pro is also available in the volume purchased app store. So um, okay. that worked out to, great for our school. Do you want me to walk do you want to walk through hopscotch while I throw it on reflector then? Sure. Okay, we can do that one too. Let me get back on there real quick. So they hopscotch just ones. they really are. And hopscotch, uh, same people make hopscotch and daisy, and they're a really good developmental fit because Daisy gets students co uh, programming in the X coordinate plane and Hopscotch adds to that the Y coordinate plane. What I was just talking with the teachers in my school today was, okay, um, at what grade level do we learn Cartesian plane because how much of X and Y do I have to... Uh, why are we stuck on Jeff? Are we stuck? There, I don't know. Can Hopefully you see me? We're not. I can see you. I need to check the teacher I cast can, feed. I can see what's up. I can see the app. Okay, good. Can you see the monster, the Halloween monster that's illegal right now at Sam's school? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. The gorilla is dressed up as Frankenstein. That's no good. It's no good. We don't want to have that conversation. <laughs> um, but what you can see when we're looking at this app is there on the right in the different color bands are categories of commands. And we, what you start with is a trigger. When the button is tapped or when the iPad is shaken, when the iPad leans left, you know, there's a lot of the internal controls of the iPad the kids have access to. Now, as a tech integration specialist, what makes me nervous is even on Daisy, the two commands they were using were touch and shake. Um, when I give the iPads out to the kids, I tell them, don't shake them, right? Because the last thing I want is a second grader going like this. <laughs> like it's an Etch-a-Sketch because that's just, you know one or two finger, slippery finger pads away from throwing it across the room. Um, so I try to, you know, go towards tapping or tilting on that. But you can see that the, um, you can scale their appearance, you can have them draw a line. What I really like is that, uh, that purple set, you've got the leave a trail which okay. can have them draw a line. And this is really great because then you can give them the challenge of making the animal, avatar, sprite, whatever you want to call it, write their name. So they actually have to program in the directions for their name. And the turns are based in degrees. So they have to say, okay, I'm going to turn, you know, 45 degrees or 250 degrees or whatever it is. Um, so I'm anticipating that when I roll this one out, I am going to have to do a little bit of education with a protractor and a Cartesian plane just so they understand kind of where... You know, if I want to turn right, what does that look like? What is that number? 
Um, and yeah, there's some variable stuff in there, which I don't think I'm going to teach directly to when I do it with the lowest level. Um, but if you look in that screen of commands you've got open right now, John, when you go all the way to the bottom, you can see that it says something like when Frankenrella, I guess yeah. it's the Frankenstein gorilla, collides with. So you can set up each sprite that sets up on its own path, but you can make it so when the two sprites collide with each other, something happens. They turn direction, they spin around, they grow, they shrink, what have you. So in a lot of ways, you know, here we're going beyond just having one sprite that you give directions to, to programming interactions and types of behaviors so that you could actually create a game in this, um, in this profile. Yeah, this is, I always kind of looked at this one as hopscotches on the age group. It's kind of like 9 to 11 or whatever. I kind of looked at it as the next, if they've gotten Daisy, if they've mastered Daisy the Dinosaur, this is where they move to next kind of thing. Yeah, I'm imagining it goes Daisy the Dinosaur, Hopscotch, Scratch. Because okay. there's a lot of kind of side-by-side -side Hopscotch and Scratch, even though Scratch has a much higher possible functionality. Um, it doesn't really have an iPad uh, platform. So this gives you that same object-oriented programming as Scratch, but on the iPad. Um, I don't think you've told it to do anything other than change its costume, and I haven't really. There, I it out. there, I had it move. Forward. There you go. You got to move forward. When the play button is tapped. Right. But that's pretty cool. I like that one. Yeah. So, I, I like that one a lot too. You've got text sprites that you can do, so they could actually build presentations similar to what they do in Scratch, in um, Hopscotch. Cool. Like that one. Let's see what else I've got. Oh, have you ever seen this one, Sam? This is the other one. This is the last. I, I might as well leave the iPad up then if you've seen. Have you seen this one, this Lightbot one? I haven't seen Lightbot. I heard about Bot Logic Us, but I think that's web-based. What does Lightbot do? Okay, so Lightbot is, I think it's a little bit more simple as, uh, as it's the same thing. So here, I'll do challenge one. Okay, so what it does basically is it'll it'll totally lead you through it then. So it'll go, okay, tap anywhere. I need you to go to the blue tile and then light up and then walk forward. So it only has two different commands right here. And then oh, okay, walk up. forward and light up. Got it. Right, so you got to go like this. Those uh, are the only two I need to get through the day. So, right, exactly. So I wanted to walk forward to and light up on that square, so then I'll hit the play button. Right, so like, this right. sets up that every block you have to give it a new command. Right. Okay. And then you go through and it does that. And so it's just kind of a different one that you can go through and just little challenges. Almost like Daisy the Dinosaur, except, totally. um, you know, just with little robots. Right, Sometimes and this has you, you turning left and right. Yeah, that makes sense. No, I have to say for this one, and I know I, I, I don't, I'm trying to throw it out there, but um, my son, who is autistic and in second grade, does like these, and I like the fact that they've actually picked dinosaurs and robots, things that really appeal to his autisticness, let's say, <laughs> if, if that's even a word. But so you can go, and so now on this one, you're going to have to go around it, and it'll give you some new commands and say, there's the left, there's the right, and good luck, and then you have to go ahead and program that one out. So let's see if I can do this one. I'm going to turn right, I guess. I'm going to go forward to, then I'm going to take another right turn, and then I'm going to light up and see if I got it. And see, this kind of go. oh, and see, I didn't get it, so now I have to go. But see, that's what you have to do. And so you're like, okay, well, which one did I do wrong? I'm going to have to assess. All right, let's try right. it Right, and it's that, it's that move that I absolutely love, where the kids have to go back into what they've written and figure out what they need to change. There we go. There it is. And if you can't, you know what? It does, it's not worth doing if you can't fail. Yeah. Go ahead and edit your work. So... That one's Lightbot, and I thought that that one was pretty cool as well. That's an interesting Little question. Somebody, somebody in the chat said, you know, if everybody's using Scratch during the hour of coding with MIT, oh, is there going to yeah. be bandwidth issues? And, um, you know, if it was only one hour that everyone was trying to do at the same time, I think the answer to that would be a definite yes. Yeah, that would be. But I'm not sure. Um you know, it all depend on how many people are using that uh, that MIT interface. Yeah, that's good. The MIT people are the ones that made the EdCamp online too. Right, and with those, the those, on those, Hangout. Those MIT people, they're they're uh, they're not just sitting on their uh, hands and 
twiddling got, their thumbs, are they? They got brains and they do stuff. I know it's horror. I mean, I like it. That is, it's good stuff. I like that too. Hey so guys, anyway, those are the apps. What's the next step? I mean, once we get by these little kitty iPad apps, what is the next step for the high school or middle school kid that wants to advance into coding? Well, you take your uh, Raspberry Pi board and you program your Python into it and you make your own drone, Jeff. That sounds a little <laughs> bit like it's a, it's an extra step. What's the step in between there, Walker? Oh, um, I hear it's programming advanced CCS S into your... Back, uh, back up a step. Back up a step. <laughs> uh, making a web page? Sounds good. I can do that. Are, are yeah. there any in the middle steps? I mean, like we, we talk about the same thing in the music theory realm. It's either Freddie the Frog does quarter notes or it goes straight into college level theory text. I, I'm having a hard time finding those in the middle things. There, there's actually a lot of transition things, and it kind of depends on what platform you're on. We've been talking about iPad-based stuff, but you could say, like, if you look browser-based coding, you could look at something like Tinker or Roblox or Minecraft as at this same level, mm -hmm. that they'd be doing Hopscotch or something like that, maybe interacting in Minecraft, so they have both kind of an author role as well as a player role in an online gaming environment, cooperative learning, that kind of thing. And from there, they can program in Tinker or Scratch. Uh, Don't you, um, Walker, can you sit up just a little bit? <laughs> Thank you. But then, but then my, my, my thing shows. <laughs> well, then you're not on the screen. <laughs> Hey, Waka, I was going to say, um, can you ask Sam? I thought he was going to show, I think a good next step afterwards, so if we're just, those are just iPad apps that we were talking about, and we know that iPad apps aren't exactly the greatest for, um, you know, the, I think it's good for basics for elementary kids, and that's where I teach and have taught, but um, what about um, right at the end, I think when you get to middle school, GameStar Mechanic, which is online, and you seemed like you were set up for that one, Sam, so... Yeah, what was your experience I've, with GameStar Mechanic? Because I have a little experience, but it's just other teachers I've watched use it. Well, well, basically, as I've been talking to people about um, coding and game design, I was looking at something that I think was called Game Designer or something like that that they used in the summer program I was in. But the um, most of the people I talked to recently are like, no, you have to go GameStar Mechanic. Um, and GameStar Mechanic is a website that it gives really good instruction on game design and allows you to really build your own game. Hold on, let me turn on the screen share here. Um, yeah, you won't need a reflector for this one. Right. So that should... Is that it? No. I have to say, I have to say, as Sam's getting ready too, I um, watched two teachers in my school district last year use GameStar Mechanic, and um, they're very um, good at sharing, and uh, both of them are uh, moderately active on Twitter. Mariana Hussein and Mo Grulik are GT teachers, so if you are interested in GameStar Mechanic and learning a little bit more, I could connect you with those people, and they could tell you exactly. I've seen them use it. Um, make some phenomenal games from kids and go through, and they we even started making videos and having the kids talk through it. It was it was fascinating. I just kind of helped out, and those two just did it all. It was awesome. Well, that sounds great, and I'll definitely be in touch with you with that because what we've got at at uh, Game Stars, they actually have some courses designed, which is really great because it gets people who've actually made games to walk you through the process of designing and constructing a game, and I think it's a good medium especially for a situation where, you know, the teacher in the room might not be a professional game designer because I, I don't know for sure, but I think that professional game designers might be paid better than teachers. Um, I've possibly. heard that. And I think there might be slightly different skill sets. Even as tech teachers, we're always kind of struggling to be where we need to be. So sites like this one, which have lessons that kids can walk through, and resources for them. They can take an online course. They can do some of this at home. They can be at school. I and the more I work with tech and kids, the more I'm a fan of browser-based uh, programs because it allows the students to work on the program at home as much as at school. And while my tech class doesn't really have the luxury of assigning homework, I think on a really good day, the work we do is going to be so engaging they're going to want to do more at home. 
and I want to be able to give them the access to do that. So the seventh grade, I don't think they know it yet, but Game Store Mechanic is where they're going next. It was really cool um, when um, the GT teacher, Mo, when she did it at our school, she basically had the kids, it was the fifth graders that were in there, and that you know that's before they go to middle school in, our, in our Texas. And so what she did basically was she had them do kind of something that had a, a game that had an environmental impact. So what they were trying to do was they were trying to kind of teach make a game that would teach younger kids or kids that played it some environmental lessons but make it fun at the same time. So they were trying to get kind of all the elements in there. So like if the kid tapped this box, then it would give something and say, did you know that, you know, um, using a water filter is better than drinking bottled water because bottled water, you know, has empty bottles fill up this much of a landfill and and it, it was just interesting to see the kids because then that's what I would do with them after um, they would go through their games I just kinda sat in there and watched them go ahead and do it and I just taped them talking while while they were kind of showing their video on the big you know screen and uh, it was very interesting to see and uh, I tried to help out the best I could but um Something definitely that if you like coding or you like getting kids, I mean, the kids were working at home a lot on it. I know that they were, and that's something they didn't mind doing. You know, they didn't mind going and making improvements. So to me, that's not homework. That's what that's kind of what we do in our off time as well, on uh, as teachers, really, as you know, nerds like us. <laughs> you know, word word booty. So anyway, but yeah. So if you need to, if you if you're interested in GameStar, I'm sure that Mo and Mariana. I think Mariana actually used to run, and I don't think she did this year, but she used to do a tech camp over the summer for kids, and I think that was cool. Which is also kind of a a cool thing. I know that Wes Fryer likes to do the whole like, you know, media club where you're talking and sharing your stories, but you could also do that little coding club after school. With your, you know, and get the kids going that way too. If you couldn't fit it into school time, I'm sure there would be at least five or six kids that would be interested in doing a coding club for an hour a week after school. If you were, you know, that kind of a exactly. And really, what I want to do in class is I want to provide enough of a, a kind of ignite session so that they can get into something, they can try it out, they can get to the end of it, and then if they want to do more, you know, we're going to be awesome. Right, right. So, anyway, those are some of the things I like. I like the uh, Game Star seemed to get a really positive feedback from, and you know, and then the thing I guess that you always look for is in this class, uh, um, the boys were into it, but the girls were into it as well, and they, they did a good job. And I think that that's the key, it. right? And so I think that I've saw something on that kind of browse through and say, how do we get the girls more interested? I tell you what. If you give them the chance, the girls are interested in this, and they do a they did a darn good job on some of these games that I saw. So, well, just you know, throwing that out there. Something I've seen too, at least in the high school level, we've adopted a um, Lego robotics course, and that's a lot of good coding practice to program these robots in order to you know follow. Pre- you know, tra- trajectories and things that you've set out and actually also to be able to, you know, compete against each other to uh, complete tasks and see how short of a coding sequence you can put together in order to complete something. And this, these classes that I come in and walk through are just so busy. The kids are just totally into it. They're always full, and it's really a fascinating thing. So... I think Lego Robotics is doing some really cool stuff, and I think some schools are starting to pick up on them and run just Lego Robotics classes, uh, and that's been really cool to see develop, at least on our end. I, I've been doing some work with the uh, first Lego League, Lego Robotics Challenge mm-hmm. this year, and uh, it, it is really exciting, and I'm just doing it in an after-school club, and we've got, uh, I think, in a week and a half or two weeks, the competition coming up, Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I were to be completely candid, I am not worried about us going to the state level Cool. at all. There's just going not going to happen. We, But <laughs> the, uh, I think the opportunity and the invitation to code with the kids and to get that work done is really great. 
Um, I'm excited to be able to work with them outside of this super structured giant first Lego League challenge mm -hmm. that has all of the different directions because you know I think we're going to actually be able to learn some more advanced coding skills when we're working in a slightly more focused and unified way. Sure. But you know that that could be the old man teacher in me kind of <laughs> going against the the seeming chaos of this club. But they are learning a lot, and what's yeah. great is both the Lego NXT and the, their new platform, the EV3, both operate with a really uh, fairly fundamental object-oriented programming. There you go. There's Ooh, the nice. EV3. Yeah. Jeff's got relatives that work at Lego. Yes, he does. Ah, very nice. <laughs> he's, got, he's got connections. Yes, I do. So it's good to know, because those are not easy to come by. They, are, they were back order. There was all kinds of issues. We got ours in a timely manner because we were part of the first Lego League, but I think schools got priority shipment on that. That's what I've heard. So yeah, he was uh, he, he handed it to me and said, this is very difficult to turn over because everyone wants these. <laughs> wow. So, now did you, did you get the expansion kit that comes with the giant elephant feet? There's like, there's two boxes that ship with the uh, first Lego League. There's one box which is the educational pack and one box which is the supplement. I don't believe so. Uh, I'll have to give you the kit numbers on the supplement. There's some great pieces in there. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, well, I'm excited to check it out because I know that you know, there's just so much that kids are thriving on with this stuff, and I just want to make sure I know what the heck it is. <laughs> oh, totally. And it's just transformational to have them say, okay, here is this thing, and you gave it these directions, and that made it do this. You know, now make it do something slightly different. Now take these commands and replace it with this sensor and do these different commands. I mean, it's really phenomenal to see these kids working with um, actually radians, right? They're trying to figure out how many rotations of the wheel it's going to take to get from point A to point B, and they're measuring the circumference of the wheel, and they're using pi, pi r. I mean, just like it's applied That's mathematics, so cool. and it's so great. Yeah, it's really exciting. So I'm excited to see that unfold and see, you know, how far and deep it goes within, you know, all the different content areas because there's so much that can be applied to it. It's really neat. It really is. I'm going to say that also here, I, I know some people in my school district that um, were, uh, that are robot experts as well, and there's a, there's a couple of them. So if there are people, and I know one, this, there's this guy at my uh, Westlake High, and Jeff Bradbury will like this because it's the high school where Nick Foles went to high school, Jeff Bradbury. There we go. Um, but it's Coach Norm, and Coach Norm always has these outstanding robotics teams with Lego Robotics, and he's always one of their testers and everything. So I guess as Connected Educator Month comes and goes, if you are interested in these things, I know that I don't know a ton about robotics, but I know some really good people like Coach Norm and Jen Flood and Sandy Crump and Mo Grulick again that do all these robot robotics things. And if you're interested and want to learn a little bit more, I could totally connect you with those people. They're happy to spread the word because that's how much they love. I mean, especially Coach Norm and Jen Flood, they they like eat, sleep, and drink robotics. And I, I remember I was going to help uh, our G teacher, Mo, one time, and she just looked at me and she said, John, you, you, it, it'll take up a lot of your time, all these competitions and all this after-school stuff. She's like, I'll keep doing it. Don't worry. She's, she's like, spare yourself the time. You'll never – it's a lot of time to give. But these a lot of dedicated people give it. You don't think she was like, John, I don't have time to teach you this stuff. I think that's what it was, really, actually. She was like, I don't have the time or the patience to teach you, you doofus. <laughs> right, I work with fifth graders. They learn quickly and are highly motivated. That's right. Well, at least she was polite in the way she said it. That's so good, that people. A good thing. That's class right yeah, there. See, see, that's what I'm talking about. These people are very classy. Awesome. So anyway, but yeah, those are good. All right, so on a different topic, if we sweet, if we switch over and we got it, we have a little bit of time left. Um, what about the maker movement? We were talking about a little bit this on uh, Techlandia. We we're talking about it. How about the makey makey? Has anybody ever uh, gotten the old fifty dollar makey makey kit and tried that out with the kids? No. Kind of uh, the same thing. We're we're going our Arduino boards at our school. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, there's a. Uh, the, the tech director has a technology elective 
that they were doing some kind of breadboard, just make a circuit, see what a diode does, those kinds of things. And then he went out and bought a handful of Arduino boards, and he's got the kids programming them to do different things now, and he's going to try to get them to design a LED sign that broadcasts information in both English and Hebrew. And that's oh, wow. really tricky because... The Hebrew letters won't work with a standard eight-slot LED. You have to have, like, cross pieces. So, yeah. So he's looking for, like, the kids to design a scrolling sign in two languages. Wow. That sounds cool. Cool. I like the I like the maker movement, and I think that the Makey Makey is pretty cool. I met those guys at uh, the IPDX conference uh up in Portland last February, and we bought one for my daughter, and it's it's pretty interesting to sit there and go through all those things. And then another one, um, I've seen, I'll have to look at the one, I don't think I put it in the show notes, but um, there is one that is geared specifically in the maker movement for girls, and it was made by um, just an old teacher. And, uh, just, she, an old just an old teacher. I know I say it, but right, so it was, made by, it was designed by a teacher, and she quit her job and really wanted the girls to go through I'll look through. It's got to be in some of my notes. But um, there's another one called Little Bits, too, where you can buy all these little different kinds of things. And Little Bits is, uh, I, put the, I did put that one in the show notes, and um, those are like little kits that you can go ahead and start do, crafting the whole thing. And I, uh, it seems to be really popular up in Portland right now as they're doing a bunch of different maker fairs, and it seems like they've done a lot more with those um, types of things. Um, Allison, again, up in Portland has been a part of a bunch of those. I think there's been at least well, three and or four. It's, it's a lot bigger than, you know, the marginally unclean hippies up there. You know, you've got, whoa, he just slandered all of Portland. Um, you've got... <laughs> <laughs> Just seeing if they're watching. No, you've, you've got kind of these little maker fairs popping up all over the place, and it's a great movement to recognize the role of creativity and innovation in education. I think that what we're going to have to be careful of is that the maker fair movement doesn't get co-opted into you know some sort of corporate creativity movement where everything we're doing is coming to us in these little kits where you have to buy the next module. Right. in order to kind of come up on it. Even even to some extent in the Lego Mindstorms world, right? you get this kit and you can make two or three robots out of this, but you have to get these other parts to do these other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the maker movement is at its most powerful when it's you know the equivalent of here's some knowledge and access to like Radio Shack from the 80s, right? And <laughs> right. Where you could actually get a lot of direct parts easily. Um, but I think it's going to take a lot of mindful implementation to keep it um, accessible and meaningful like that so you're not just dropping kids into guided activities that are you know, have been makerfied. Right. I, I do have to say that when I saw the um, TED Talk where you go to and we were talking about creativity, my fourth graders really enjoyed the one where you give them the, um, you give them like a piece of string, you give them like a foot of, ta- of masking tape, and you give them uh, like 25 pieces of spaghetti and you try and see how tall you can build the structure and things like that. I mean, I think that there's some value in stuff like that. Too. And you know what? I have to say, we did that the build team the first. I didn't even didn't even like say hi to them, of course. I, I said hello, I think, the first day of school. But I threw them in there, gave, showed them the video, gave them the challenge, and said, or as much of the video as I was supposed to show them, and just let them go and work together and kind of group it. And I remember at the end of the school year, they're like, aren't we going to do that one more time? And I did have the stuff for it, so we did. And then basically the bell rang and the kids looked at it, and they had done a much better job than they had done you know, uh, at the beginning of the year, and they were totally satisfied. And we totally started our year on that and ended our year on that, which is like a semi-little maker thing. But there's a good TED Talk on that where they were just talking about this is how you're supposed to you know, build team and how the study is like... If even if you put like college students into that situation, how they work together and get along. That's great. It's pretty interesting nowadays how there's a lot of unconferences, you know, ed camps that are actually including these maker spaces into their conferences. I know, Waka, what are you doing? I, I know in a few weeks over <laughs> at Ed Camp New Jersey on November 23rd, um, we're actually going to be doing a little makerspace unit because there's a lot of teachers around New Jersey who are looking at doing small robotics, small computer projects, these little science things. 
And I've seen, like I said, I've seen a lot of these things pop up at the various ed camps and conferences around here. Could, could really I just, mo- uh, could you, I just are, mention you, that? You know, I, I haven't spoken in 20 minutes, Walker. You're interrupting me. <laughs> it, it was kind of nice. Could I, could I just mention that, you know, a makerspace could be a wonderful place to, uh, like, design a puppet? Just say. <laughs> Maybe we should not do the makerspace. Uh, ow. Ow, that, that hurts me. That oh. hurts me deeply. <laughs> um, we do have a few minutes here, and I want to say thank you guys to everybody who's been out there. Simon and guest six nine or nine six nine, Peggy, Craig, of course, and everybody else. I saw Shannon even pop in there a couple times. Um, Lisa Dabs is watching too. I want to say hi out there, hi Lisa. Lisa. Um, it's been two weeks. We kind of spoke about this a little bit last week, um, but on a complete change of topics, what do you guys think of the latest Apple stuff? Mavericks, new iWorks. How do you guys feel after two weeks on it? Are we still like public and we want to keep this clean? Yes. Because <laughs> the new version of GarageBand won't record anything longer than six seconds. They shortened it. Is that it. a feature? There's no more podcast setting or movie setting. It's all just loops. Not not happy with that, Walker. Did, did you? It's not good. Did did you did you purchase? The the, the 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 upgrade pack for for GarageBand on the on the P, on the Mac. No, I did the free upgrade on the iPad, which took my really cool ten dollar GarageBand that did everything I wanted it to, and turned it into the improved GarageBand that does none of those things. I feel you on that one, John. What do you think? Right. Any comments? I- I'm I'm fine with it so far. I haven't I've wanted to mess around with iMovie a little bit more on the iPad, but I haven't had time yet. But um, so far I, I'm I'm good with Mavericks and everything. I, I I'm all good. I, I have this blog post that I'm trying to come up with that basically says, for every new feature that Apple gave us, they've taken away three. And well, to to be fair, it really seems like what they've done is they've tried to, uh, really put the center of their market on the iPad instead of the laptop. And they just moved that center. And I completely understand, after last week, that they needed to come up with a common medium, and that medium was this concept that the laptop and the computer talk to each other. So they had to strip away features, and basically, even though it's like, you know, GarageBand 11, it's really GarageBand 1 version 2. Um, they, you know, they've stripped a lot of features out. They're probably going to be adding them back in, kind of like what they did with Final Cut X. And I don't know, Jeff. What do you think? Have you uh, played around with it much? I know you're probably yeah. you're a Mavericks guy. I am, yeah. And you know, for what I use it for, it's been really good. I mean, I'm not using Wirecast, and I'm not, you know, doing a lot of editing on my end. And so, you know, the modest speed improvements between my day to day apps and things that I'm using on my laptop have been really nice. But, you know, I'm totally in agreement with what you're upset about, Jeff, because while we're while they're trying to weave together the two platforms between the mobile tablet iOS and now their desktop uh, computers, the issue is that there are significant differences that people use the desktop computers for that you cannot discredit. I mean, apparently There's- you're using it for the touchscreen, aren't you, Jeff? Yeah, incorrectly, yes. I mean, I could apparently just switch to my iPad and be totally fine at this point. But, um, you know, it's something to really think about because why continue making a Mac Pro if it's just going to be a dialed-up iPad? You know what I mean? Does that make sense? If you're saying that they're going to be converging to the point that, you know, the whole idea behind the Mavericks platform is to interact with iOS more seamlessly then why have a computer that can handle so much more? I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I will tell those who are out there who have kind of were with me last week when I went off a lot more. Um, <laughs> I had to get my – I actually took my laptop into the Apple store and had them reformat the whole thing. And then I had them put back on Mountain Lion. So I downgraded my operating system on one of my computers so I can continue broadcasting because – the broadcasting software that we're using right now called Wirecast doesn't work on Mavericks yet, which is okay because eventually they're going to put a patch to that. But to answer your point, Jeff, it's still only a 32-bit app that Wirecast is. 
which means it doesn't matter if you have an iMac running 27 gigs of RAM, which it can if you buy it, or if you have a Mac Pro running a 12-core chip, Wirecast is only a 32-bit app, which means at the most it can only use 4, meg- four gigs of RAM. So I, I completely see what you're saying, and, and right. yeah, a lot of good stuff. But anyway, well, then, I know I mean, if, you, if you follow along with Tech Educator, we are going to be having some shows in the future where we break down the new apps. We're going to talk a little bit about Mavericks. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of go for it. Simon in the chat made a really good point. It's not just Mac, though. It's also Windows. Windows 8, you know, that whole thing that everyone's freaking out that, you know, they're really shifting to a tablet environment. What are we going to do? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it is the same idea where these companies are really trying to figure out how their two different platforms work together and how their devices can all be seamlessly integrated. And it is a challenge. And so I think that while we're kind of upset, so to speak, about how Mavericks may have rolled out and changed some of the ways that we're used to doing things. Uh, you know, Peggy is also right that it's very new and it's going to get ironed out and it's going to be something that's probably ending up really being positive. But um, you just need to work it out and figure out how they're going to interact together. I think it's interesting that it's not only the computer industry that's having this. I saw a device that it was one of those wake up at 2 in the morning when your wife goes... Um, goes and and i put on one of these infomercials and and they were selling get this they were selling a wireless fireplace that you put (laughs) on your kitchen counter to provide heat for your kitchen and it had the flaming logs and like it was the whole thing but it was a a fireplace that you put on your kitchen counter counter so apparently even home appliances are trying to figure out if it's a desktop or a, or a tablet device kind of a thing and they're not sure what it is so it was my understanding that jeff that's just your your imac when you're when you're actually streaming wirecast um, can't you just have that in your kitchen that puts off probably at least a good 100 degrees <laughs> I, i'm in a closed room right now with five monitors running and uh yeah uh it's pretty warm here especially for the uh the Ed Camp New Jersey hoodie, by the way. Anyway, that's about all the time we have. Please join us next week. We have another part two. Sam, would you like to talk about what we're doing next week? Next week, we are talking to Shannon Miller Woo-hoo! about coding in the younger grades. She worked with a program called Bot Logicus in, I think, a third grade class. And we had a great interchange about that uh, on Twitter, and I suggested that she come on the show and talk to us about her experiences, challenges, and lessons learned with coding with younger kids. Sam, what's going on this week for you at the Petui Network? Uh, I saw some activity going on on the website there. Yeah, the Petui Network has a great chat lined up this week. We have a... Oh, now you're challenging me to look something up really quick. We have a new um, guest moderator... And that's going to be Sean Storm. He's at SS Storm 01. And he is going to be helping me moderate a chat that's all about parent conferences and hacking the parent teacher conference experience. Sounds great. It should yeah, be that's fun. That's cool. That's very cool. Jeff, what's going on yeah. with you this week? Like I said, finishing up our uh, guide and comprehensive tool to understand Apple Configurator, uh, especially now that it's changed so much with iOS 7. And uh, also going to be sharing out information about what I get about CU Meeting. And uh, they ha- uh, according to them, I'm going to be having uh, about five or so free trials, six months trials to give out. So keep an eye out on that if you're interested in getting a hold of one of those. And uh, I have to ask, what do you think about the new Evernote features? Have you tried out actually using the presentations feature? I have not. I have only interacted with the new Evernote and the fact that the design has changed. Jeff, I have to break in and say that yesterday at the SV Summit, I took all of my notes directly into Evernote. Instead of picking up flyers off the vendors' tables, I was just scanning them into the notes format. I combined the notes at the end of the day. I recorded everything, the all the pitch sessions with my live scribe pen. I put a hundred page uh, no a hundred different documents into my Evernote last week with a scanner. I'm just at this point hooked on Evernote and going oh, yeah. more into it. And, and we and might I, we might want to say, Sam, on record, we love the company ScanSnap, don't we? ScanSnap is amazing. And Certainly you know, are. I've 
I've been waiting for an easy way to take to get rid of all these binders I'm hauling around. And sometime this week, I'm going to roll out a blog post I'm working on that has like four different videos of me scanning different stuff in. That's fast-paced action, brother. So if you'd like to watch Sam use a sheet feeder, you can check him out over at bethedistraction.org. That's right. I sped those parts up, though. <laughs> and uh, I've also ordered my live scribe three pen, so Ooh. excited about Ooh. that. John, uh, yeah, what's going on nice. this week with you? Uh, I'm getting ready for EdCamp ATX that will be on Saturday, and we are nervously anticipating and hoping that we can negotiate, the three of us can negotiate getting all the people there and getting them out and having a good productive Saturday at EdCamp ATX. Nice. And that's all, that's that's about where I'm laser focused right now. There's Very a, cool. There's, of course, a lot of great things happening this week over on TeacherCast. On Thursday and Friday, look for us online constantly. We are going to be broadcasting live from the New Jersey Educators Convention. I am so looking forward to this. They gave us a 20-foot by 20-foot booth, and it's in the middle of the football field. I can't wait to be out there. We're going to have a ton of work. I'm going to be doing three... Sam, you're still online. I'm going to be doing three great presentations. Two of them are going to be on WordPress, and the other one is going to be a two-hour workshop on creating a 21st century paperless classroom. So all of that stuff is going to be happening, and I think I've got two podcasts scheduled for Tuesday on Election Day because we're off from school. If... If you're watching us from New Jersey, please vote Democrat. I will tell you guys, thank you so much for being here. And we will see you next week live. We'll have coding, Shannon Miller, and much more right here on the Tech Educator Podcast. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you at 930 for Principal Cast featuring Spike Cook, Jessica Johnson, and Teresa Steger. Thank you so much. See you next week. Bye.